What's going on, Jay? How you doing? I'm good. How are you, Chris? How are you, Craig? Craig needs to pay attention when we call hey, he, him the first time. He's not he's the doing, seventh time. He's doing his job mostly, most of the time lately. I'm watching him. So watching yeah. Him. Yeah. We we had that little uh, live stream earlier. How'd that yeah, go? We, yeah, we were live on our Twitch channel, Grumpy Dungeon Masters on Twitch. And uh Check us we out. watched <laughs> we watched the final uh panel that they had for their D D celebrations for twenty twenty one. Which is really cool by the way. I really like the fact that they have a website that's interactive, that has a bunch of puzzles, that has a bunch of like cool wallpapers to download and whatnot. Um on my stream, I had all my players go to the Feywild Carnival and actually try some of the puzzles out. And it's more for Adventures League, but if you solve the puzzles, you're given a magic item. All right? And the magic item's not a powerful thing. And Like, one of the magic items is a stuffed spider that when you attune to it, or not attune to it, but when you get it, you're told a command word, and you say the command word while holding it to something, and it sticks there forever until you take it off. What? So, yeah. I need um, that. There was another one that was really, really, really cool. Uh, I can pull it up here in a second. I, I personally was a fan of the glow worms in a bottle. The glow worms in a bottle, yeah. Um, generating bright light of any color however, whenever you like. Yep. Uh, the, the two I couldn't get until today when they released all the answers was the, um, the uh, buckler or folding. Okay. <laughs> this is a small paper square that fits in a pocket and is covered with runes. When you hold it in your hand, you can use a bonus action to utter a command word to cause it, the square to magically unfold, becoming a shield as hard as wood. It folds back up, uttering the same command word. It's like, a, it's like an Iron Man suit, except shield-sized. And the best part is, it's like one of those like paper mache like, like future teller things that you made in elementary school. Yep. It looks like one of those. It's amazing. I remember those so, things. They they had the eight little, yeah, eight, yeah, like eight sections. You'd move your hands, and I never could make those things though. So if you if if you, I let all the players like do the puzzles, we spent like the first thirty minutes on stream playing with the puzzles, and uh, a couple of them got a few of them. One of them got um, the the cask of the um, the calliope cask, calliope cask, calliope cask, yeah, and then he died. Um, very first combat session of the night. Uh, so he had to re-roll a character, and well, Fate Wild came out. Oh, like week. he actually died, died. He died, died. He, I made up a monster that I called an angular troll, like the angular fish. And one of its tentacles had evolved to basically mimic a glowing, a wounded glowing fairy, and it was hopping around on the ground. No, well, he he got caught by an angle, like an angler fish. Oh, that's fucking yeah. great. He ran right up to it and did a medicine check on it without looking it over first. And I'm like, oh, 18 medicine check tells you that that's not a real fairy. That's a tentacle. And I was like, does 27 hit your AC? He's like, yeah. Okay, well, I'm pinned. And then he didn't try to escape the first couple rounds. And he finally got pinched to death. And the whole time, all the players had to do was basically just kill the thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but it scuttled away, brought him down deep into the darkness. Um, as he uh continued to fail all of his oh he actually passed all of his death saves, so he was unconscious in the in the troll's pincer as it climbed it climbed down the rocky uh cliff. Right. Um when he after he had after he had the, the troll had gotten away with him, um my wife was next in initiative and I let her have the the choice to either shoot him or shoot the Chol, because the Chol had five hit points left. She shot and him, didn't she? Basically, either save him from a death of being eaten alive or kill the Chol. So she shot the Chol. Oh, okay. And He calculated, and it, he calculated the fall damage. He fell yep. a thousand feet, took something like 68 bludgeoning damage or something like that. It was double his hit points. He was dead. So at least he did not get eaten alive. And mm -hmm. the chol and the chol was killed, so it's a win-win situation, right? Yep. I told him that he could keep his uh, calliope, calliope, Cali calliope, 
yeah, well, that word, cask for his next character. He goes, oh, can I? I was like, oh, yeah, go ahead. He's yeah, like, go for it. all right. So he drove, he, he uh, drafted up a drunken master rabbit folk monk. And so it begins. <laughs> so now my party has a rabbit folk drunken master. And it was it's just as amazing as the first one, even though I already missed Gar the Wonder yeah, Turtle. Is his name Usagi? Uh no, it's Harris. Okay. Oh what the hell oh my god. That's just as bad. <laughs> Harris. Um, uh. But yeah, we're they're actually in the first part of the major castle dungeon. They gotta work their way through. They finished like the one courtyard and moved on to the next one. Uh Panda's uh Grumpy Dungeon Master Rubber Panda. His battle map is working perfectly. Um, I changed up. I I, I kind of gave him a vague idea, like what I wanted for each of the buildings, and, like what I wanted them to be. But it said like, "Hey, here's some extra buildings. Go nuts. I don't care what you put in there." Um, he's like, "Okay." So he he turned one into a stable, and he he put like the bedroom in one. I didn't get the garrison. He said it's going to come up later. Um. And uh, he put another just like wrecked building. And what was cool is he had like these two buildings side by side. And one of them was like wooden floor wrecked. And one was like stone tile wrecked. But it was very dark. And I want everything to be a green tinge. But these tiles were just pitch black. I was like, that kind of stands out in a very odd way. With all the stone around here glittering, glittering with like green emerald kind of colors. Um. So what I did is I set up a trap there where someone walks 10 feet in this shadow bubble just appears around them in the shape of the room and they can't leave, but anyone can run into it. And okay. while they're in that shadow, they're blind. I can still talk and everything, but they're blind. And the trick was, it's basically just you light a, a light source, a bright light source, and it diffuses the shadow bubble because all owls have dark vision. So, yeah. you know, um, but there's just a bunch of shadows in there. Just, you know, CR one half shadows. Oh my God. Did they mess everybody up because they were just stuck in a bubble and blind? <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, well, the sh yeah, because the shadows, I mean, they're going to be full strength They're You know, they can move around really well in that. And if nobody could see every attack's at disadvantage. So the shadow, the mini picture they have for it is a floating shade, essentially. Yeah. 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 But it can't fly. Did you know that? Yeah. Yep. It, well, it, it moves in shadow. It doesn't really fly. Well, when the whole bubble is shadow, can it fly? Honestly, it's wholly up to the DM. Uh, but uh, generally, like, I would just use whatever the stats are from the stat block, unless you wanted to get, you know, you can get creative. I do that all the time. Oh, yeah. My, mine flew. I didn't know that it couldn't fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, te te technically, the they don't fly, fly but, yeah, but they just move within shadow. So they can move from one point of shadow to another point of shadow. So, because <laughs> like the owl was flying up fifteen feet, and I had a flatter shot, flatter shy up, fl the, the, the shadow fly up to yeah, him. I, I want to make a flatter shy. That's a new enemy. <laughs> and uh, he's like, they don't fly. I was like, they don't. I'm like, look at the token. They're flying. <laughs> the token, like they do here. You're the DM. You you do what you want. <laughs> Yeah, they were cool with it. Um, but the team got wholly battered. Because Gar the Wonder Turtle died, he was the healer. Um, and um, they Wait, were already beaten. Your party up. has a healer? They had a healer. Your party had a healer? I've yet they to have a healer in my group. And um, they were pretty well beat up. They didn't have very many hit die left. It was still like midway through the afternoon. Um and I had a uh, giant skeleton appear, or a large, large token size mm -hmm. skeleton appear. Not, not the and... not the Icewind Dale equivalent ones. No, but similar. I took a very similar stat block from a different creature, which is what it is, lowered its stats across the board, um, and it just had a metal club. And um, we lost uh, one of the original members of the party. The uh, ranger died got crushed to death by the metal club. So two actual deaths, complete deaths, two actual complete deaths. Wow. Um, I had forgotten 
I really didn't have anything planned for the green feather that they all received at the beginning of the adventure. Um, I hate admitting that I had nothing planned for that. I was kind of hoping they would have things and do things with the green feathers, and those would be what would happen. And it gave me a very interesting thing to do with the green feather. Free reincarnation spell. He's going to say it's a phoenix feather. Yeah. So I think that's what's going to be in the campaign setting. It's a free reincarnation spell, unless you do something else other with it. Okay. Um, and I have a list of fey wild creatures you can transform into. All right. So not yep. the standard reincarnation list. Yeah, These yeah. are all reincarnations that the Hamadryad druid from the village would actually read somebody as because, yeah. you know. Yeah, my campaign has its own, uh, you know, uh, reincarnation list as well. So let's do a little bit of a quick DMing here. I'll tell you the list and let me know if you have any suggestions. Okay. Um, it's a one through D100 roll. Yep. Uh, the first 20 is Al. Yeah, it's okay. Because it's your campaign and that's what you're running, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then at a 10 scale, it's Elf High, uh, Elf Wood. Aladrin, Drow, Rabbit Folk, Pixie, Seder. And then Now what numbers 91. does the, what numbers does that go up to? Like twenty one to ninety. Okay. So about okay, so every ten got Yeah, it. every ten. And then on a five scale, the last two. A grung <laughs> and a goblin. Okay. All right, I, I can get down with that. I, I like Basically. the grung. I definitely you know I love the grungs. So. Well, that that that's more for my for my one player that can't make it right now, Sam. You know he wanted yeah. to play a grung character. Well, that's my little nod and nod and wink to him. Uh, hopefully he gets to come back sometime. Um, so yeah, that's that's five percent just for him and uh, goblin because goblins are in the Feywild oddly enough. Yeah, yeah. Didn't they have? Uh, they have a whole kingdom there. Yeah, I was gonna say they had a, a hobgoblin, the Fey hobgoblin, didn't they? Yeah, but I or thought it, it that was might have just, that might have just been a, the unearthed arcana that we it was were just the unearthed at. arcana. Um, when I looked up the fourth edition Heroes of the Heroes of the Feywild book, mm-hmm. they didn't mention a hobgoblin town; they mentioned a goblin town. Okay, so that's why I went with goblin. Yeah, the thing is, if you're playing around with the Fey, man, there are so many other things that you have access to turn yeah. people into you have nixies pixies brownies uh red I, caps. Keep, I did want to keep it to the fey wild player creation list sure yeah and i get that but i'm just saying yeah. if you really wanted to get creative it gives you just this huge list of things you could turn people into yeah all right all right please you can sit with me i'm tired of putting you down yeah, and you you know me, I'm a fan of really just sort of getting creative with stuff like that, and I like having access to a whole lot of different races and things like that. Like Red Caps, I don't even believe is a playable race, no. but in this case, I would probably create something to add that to that list. I have something amazing planned for the next session. All right, um, well, I, 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 I hope, I'm not going to mention it, I want everyone to turn, tune in and watch it. I think you all will love it. Um, I hope my players don't go all murder hobo on it, but oh my god, I cannot wait. <laughs> um, there was an encounter that they skipped though that was kind of sad that they skipped. There was a fountain in the middle of this area, and I said, "Hey, panda, draw some mushrooms around it." He's like, "Oh, well, how big are mushrooms? Normal size mushrooms, all over it." So he, that's what he did. Yep. And so when you stat the encounter block, you actually put in a myconid. Sovereign, two adults, and like four saplings. Okay. Okay. So it's a fairly hard encounter for level five character. I think it's difficult to encounter for level five players, but not impossible. Sure. Um, especially if you're ranged. If you're all melee, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Because thirty foot range on spores. But yeah. they're not hostile. They won't attack. And it's it was mainly supposed to be a role playing encounter. You could easily skirt around it, which is what my players did. Because they were just, they had noped out of everything after two player deaths. Um, yeah, I can't what, blame them. I mean, I can't blame them. But what the encounter is is when you get up there and you approach them, the sap, the little, the little uh, sapling uh, mic, and it's sort of kind of like dancing around you and whatnot and just being all fey wildy. Um, 
But in the building to the left, there's two hidden creatures there who throw rocks and eventually horseshoes, because there are horseshoes over there, um, at the Mykonids that try to instigate a fight. Oh, that's just rude. Little right? jerks. So, like, if the players are cool enough, they can persuade their way down. Like, hey, that's not us. We're not throwing rocks at you. Just look at our hands. You know? They're throwing rocks um, back at whatever the fuck's throwing the rocks in the first place. Yeah. Or, you know, you do some checks with, like, investigation and figure out, oh, the rock's being thrown from over there. And you go check that out. Or, like, one of them throws to throw a ho- horseshoe. So that's, you know, that kind of pops up. Like, hey, that's a horseshoe. Yeah. We don't have horses. And, um... That was a cute little encounter that they, that they missed. But next session, the meat of it comes through. They're all level five now. So they got that extra attack. Oh, yeah. And that, that makes all the world of difference in combat. Makes all the world of difference. Yes, it does. And um, the, more I'm, the more I'm playing this campaign out after this, after this castle and mine area, I don't know if it's going to end at eight. It may go all the way up to ten. You do what I do. Just run until you're actually just done running. I mean, I, I know you're writing up a campaign that spo- you want to get published at some point, so it's supposed to have a beginning and an ending. But me, I don't like running campaigns with absolute endings, usually. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I've run campaign up to 20. Uh, the campaign I'm running at the moment, I have an ending spot. But I also have plans past that. So, like, I have no idea what level they'll be when this thing it wraps up. Uh, I would guess probably somewhere between 15 to 20. But that's just me. I like running long-term campaigns. I like I like the Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, how they're set up. And we'll probably they, talk about that a little bit later, too. Well, yeah, we should definitely talk about the the what they're talking about doing. Yeah. I like, I like that. I like that there are contained stories that have a beginning, middle and end. Yes. And I don't mind the long term campaign story either. That never ends. But at the same time, it's from a show standpoint, it needs to be the former. You can't. Well, I, I disagree with that wholly. Uh, but it's very difficult. It's pretty much impossible to write an unending campaign um, if you're going to write it for selling. You know, you have to have an ending for it sooner or later. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, home on the homebrew level, no. You and whether you're streaming it or not streaming it, my God, you could just run forever. You know, the, sooner or later, the, the you, sooner or later, you sort of hit a level problem with the game. Yeah. But it, it, the, the problem with the stream is is that. You know, like you look at Critical Role and all the other successful ones, they have seasons. Yes, they don't. They do. has to exist in a season. It doesn't have to. It or absolutely doesn't. No, new players can't jump in. You know how many times I've heard someone say, I can't watch Critical Role because I can't watch all the seasons from beginning to end to know what's going on. And everyone's like, uh, well, it's sort of season two, like everything else. No, what you do with, uh, is you have a, a primer, basically. You know, a, a very, a, at the beginning of every show, you get a little five-minute introduction of these are the characters. These are what they've Last done. Last time on Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, every time I watch an episode of The Flash, it's like, this is what's happened previously on The Flash. <laughs> there, you know, you could easily do that. Yeah, but okay, if, if I gave you a show, I want you to watch JoJo Bazaar's Adventure. Well, are you, okay, are you give me give me a real show at least. Come on. Are you gonna are you gonna start at season three? Possibly. Hmm. Yeah, and that holy bizarre adventure. Start at season three. Yeah, that'll never happen. That show is bad. The first two seasons are junk. You got to start at season three. Uh. Anyways. Look, I don't think of a D&D game streaming a- as the equivalent of a TV show. I just don't. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe some people do. I would imagine some people do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an issue at all. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I-, I care less about the streaming aspects of it and more about, you know, running it for my own people, running it for my guys. And uh, Yeah. 
yeah, you know, I can literally run a campaign forever if levels, yeah, you know, the levels make things difficult. Yep. Just because, yeah, you know, as you get higher levels, it's more of this and more of that, and geez, the stats just get bigger and bigger. But yeah. story story wise, it's you know not an issue. Uh, hell, I, I just mean, I, I ran this past we, weekend, and it was the second game session in a row without combat. You yeah. know, it's it's literally just been storytelling for two whole game sessions at this point, and my players are absolutely loving every moment of it. Yeah. D and D is it is kind of what you and your players make of it, which is definitely true. Um, now I'm going to complain. Like now I'm going to complain about the direction that they're taking Five E. <laughs> after after saying it is what you make of it. Well, I don't think you have to worry about that because I think Six is coming out here soon. But that we'll, we'll get back swing back to that in a little bit. I think that uh, I think there's a lot of potential in the core Fae Run d d rules to work past level 20 in 5th edition. Oh, sure. I mean, I've played like it 1 up to 30. Yeah. There are level 12 spells. Uh, I wish they would release content. There? Yes. So, Summon Terrasc is a level 12 spell. Summon Meteor is a level 12 oh, spell. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's fair. Uh, um, I, in 3rd in edition, they actually had, when you hit epic level progressions, they actually had spells. That you could continue that were level ten, level eleven, level twelve, yeah. and so forth. Like they had those spells, they existed, they were in the actual book. And I wish I wish five E had those. Me too. Me too. I wish fighters had something to do after just attack, 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 attack at level twenty. Yeah, I mean that's just sort of the nature of the fighter. E- even the earlier editions, that's pretty much what you did. Yeah. You soak up the like, damage and there, attack. There are, there are no Paragon classes in 5th edition. Just really weird. I know they no, kind of yeah. rolled all it into, into the the subclasses, but like, maybe like, let us take a second subclass at 15 or something? I don't know. Uh, Well, I mean, that you can always multi-class at level 15. Yeah, it's not the same. I, I know it's not, but that's kind of, yeah, that's what you got. Like, like it going from a fighter to a samurai to a blade master is like that level progression that I want in my role playing character, you know? So and it's easier for some classes than other classes to kind of see that progression, have it laid out in front of you. Yeah. Um but like I don't know how you do it like sorcerer, for example, but um, yeah. let me let me just throw this out at you because I know I harken back to earlier editions a lot of time, but it's easy to make those comparisons. Uh, with third edition, specifically with the Dragon Lance campaign, uh, you could start out as a fighter. When you hit your requirements, you could then become, say, I don't remember the exact ones, but it was like a Knight of the Rose, and then when you were, you know a level three Knight of the Rose or whatever, you could keep going until you became a level 10 Knight of the Rose, or you could switch to a different Knight class that you met the requirements of and yeah. progress in that. And there were actually certain ones that you could not become until you were a level three Knight of the Rose, a level three Knight of the Thorn. You, like you had to be level whatever in those specific Knight orders to become yeah. this final knight class. It's kind of like the jobs class for uh, Final Fantasy. Yeah. Well, like the the rogue, how, how I'd like to see the rogue progress would be like, hey, I'm going to be a rogue. At level three, I'm going to be an assassin. And at level 12, whatever, yeah. um, you now chose a rogue guild to join. Sure, become and master assassin. <laughs> you know, well, not even master assassin. Like I said, leave that for the fighter to have the three levels of skill sets. But like, now this is your guild that you're joining. And now that you've joined the guild, here's the skills that each guild have. So you could still be an assassin of like yeah. the thievery guild, you know? Yeah. It'd be um, awesome if they actually made something like that official. Uh, yeah. That being said, you can, you know, you could actually just write that up easy enough for your own campaign. Yeah. Or, you know, anybody could, uh, I, I personally, I'm, of the same mindset you are. I pr- I really and truly prefer the official source material. At any point, I can go on DM's Guild and find pretty much everything we talk about on here. 
I, yeah. I'm sure somebody's written it all up and got you know booklets I can purchase for it, but none of it's official. Well, I mean, my my opinion of that has changed a lot recently. So, like, I think it was for, um, Candlekeep, where one of the writers, one of the main, one of the lead designers of Candlekeep, the book, also has his own Candlekeep supplement on DMs Guild. Yeah, and he's also a Guild of Death member. You know, so they're recognized by Watsi as being of a higher caliber. Um, it's official so, without being official. Yeah, it's as, as official as the bonuses you're going to get. So if you can yeah. find those in DMs Guild, that's amazing. You know, it's perfect. It's yeah, one it's, of those is official. It's like if Jim Starling went out and wrote some, you know, Thanos fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's not official, but it's, you know, he, he he wrote it. So listen, if if Stan Lee could write his Babarella fanfic. Exactly. Exactly. Eh, have it become a movie and an animated show. Then by all means, anyone can write what they want. <laughs> what they want. Uh, and yes, I so, know Jim, Jim Starling. But anyway, anyway. So to stop beating around the bush, like I said, it was the D and D celebration this weekend. Uh, we did stream the future of D and D panel. And we have a recap of the announcements they announced for the future of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, next year, there's going to be you know a number of releases again. They're going to keep, continue the same structure that they had for this year, where they're going to have an anthology book, uh, a core rules book, and um, a couple of settings books. So they're releasing two settings, two books next year, that are going to be uh settings that already exist in D&D classic settings republished um yep. and of course they didn't tell us what they were yeah and while we're in stream I asked you guys for ideas what they were and you came back with the same stupid answers that we've had for like the last year and a half which is just Dragonlance Greyhark and Dark Sun so I mean there there are other options there's Planescape there's Spelljammer there's Karathor there yeah you know, there's a lot of them out there. Mm -hmm. I just think the most likely at the top, I put Dragonlance as the most likely. Well, that kind of brings us to the end of their panel, where they did announce there's a new setting next year, and they released a teaser for what that would be, and the teaser was Boo, the giant miniature space hamster, as the alternate art cover. And then our media thoughts went to being Spelljammer and Planescape. But if that's yeah. a new setting... How's it, how's it spell jammer and plans planescape? Uh, because that one of the classic it, settings they said they're going to re reintroduce. Yeah, I, I truthfully I don't know if it's a new setting. Then my money is on Boo is a planeswalker, and he goes he, uh, either that or he ends up in the city of doors in planescape, which you know gets re released, and then goes through one of the portals and ends up in this little world of miniature furry creatures, and you know, <laughs> then then we have a kids version of D and D. Like My Little Pony, except with Boo, the miniature giant space hamster. Hey guys, Chris here, hopping in the middle of the podcast to give you all of our announcements. Be sure to watch our live stream every Saturday at Twitch, uh, twitch.tv forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters at 8 p.m. Make sure to visit our website, GrumpyDungeonMasters.com, and order yourself one of our gift packs of Grumpy Dungeon Master dice. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters, and be sure to follow us on Twitter at at Grumpy DMs on Twitter. Be sure to check out our new buddies, Fate Awakens, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Fate Awakens. And also be sure to tune in every Friday at 4 p.m. when they release their new live play D&D session of their homebrew campaign. As always, be sure to check out Zenergy Gamers at zenergy gamers.com. Use code word Grumpy for 5% off any online order. Anything else to add, Jay? Uh, nope. Just over here dancing on TikTok. All right. Um, the other big announcement that they had, uh, not the big, big announcement, but the other, another big announcement they had was is that coming in January is a gift box set of the core extended rules. And that gift box will include Xanathar's Got Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and a new book, uh, what's it called? The Morty Kanan's Guide to the Multiverse? Morty Kanan's Guide 
Morden Kane and something or other monsters of the multiverse. <laughs> Let's all get the specifics here. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was definitely monsters of the multiverse because I wrote that down. It is. Yeah. Morden Canyon presents Monsters of the Multiverse. There it is. And the cover is Morden Canyon on his unicorn. That is not a unicorn. That is a Chiron. Morden Canyon on his unicorn. No, it uh, is not a unicorn. There's a giant uh, uh, astral dreadnought behind him. Oh my goodness, you. That is is a Chiron. Look it up. His unicorn. Got it. So anyways, uh, they did mention multiple times throughout the... um, panel that there was going to be multiple they kept they kept the, the multiverse was a big thing that they wanted to bring in next year so a lot of the settings are going to be multiverse themes um you know marvel does it once and bleh, that's all we get now is what i can't believe multiverse is like yeah it's the hotness now. it is it's the, the hotness. new hotness yeah uh it, i did not think about that until right now when you said it but no if if it's multiverse they have to re- it has to be planescape they re-release yeah because plates i mean that is literally the city of doors that takes you to all of the other worlds but again you know everything that's not fifth edition is not canon so eh. yeah okay i'm sure i believe all that so they did mention too there's gonna be two completely new settings and our our good friend mentioned that um, it's in the same vein as Eberron. Uh, or he, he told us that it's in the same vein as Eberron, but that's what they said in the panel. It's in the same vein as Eberron. So, what does that even mean, though? It's not going to be a Magic the Gathering one. Oh, because yeah. Eberron, oh, okay. Same, same vein as in it. It's somebody created right. their own campaign setting and yes. they, they ran with it. Yeah. Now, both of these. Originally, the leaks that happened on, on Twitter a while ago said that one was for sure and one was still in development. But Chris Perkins mentioned that both of these are still in development and they're working hard to get them to happen, but they could still be cut. Yeah. So that's a pullback from what they said before. But I'm still hoping at least there is at least one brand new setting. And I asked you guys again on the stream, what are some ideas you could do? And none of you had any good ideas. Well, what your ha- your dune your dune idea was 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 good. I will say that a giant a space political opera, space a space opera, opera basically would be interesting. I'm up for 1920s setting. I, I, for like I a can't cyberpunk tech. I can't punk. rule out the whole 1920s gangster era. Yeah, you could easily do uh, Shadowrun esque gangster era. I yeah. say shadow run when I you know basically it's dwarves, elves, you know, hobgoblins, gnolls, trolls, all that fun stuff in the nineteen twenties. You could absolutely run with that. And the fact that, you know, with uh the Feywild they're releasing artwork of people in three piece suits just leads me to believe that I I yeah, I could see them doing that. You you remember the the, the, the Netflix movie Bright, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I love that movie. You love that movie? Me too. I, I liked it a lot. I wish I wish it would have had other things. Um, yeah, it needed a lot more expanding on. Although they're doing a, another thing with it. A they TV are show doing a bright, yeah. bright anime called okay, Samurai Okay, that's what Soul. it is, yeah. That's right, yeah, yeah. It looks fantastic. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I, think, I think a 1920s with kind of following the same vein as Bright would, would be really good. I'm up for a D&D cyberpunk. I'm up for steampunk, any kind of punk technology, you know, um, would work for me. I don't care what it is, even if they wouldn't like, like dishonored and followed like oil punk, you know? Yeah. Or whale punk, I guess in that case. I I don't know, man. What you start, start labeling everything with punk and then it just doesn't mean anything anymore. No, it it just means like, this is the, all, all it means to me and what I, when I understand punk to be is this is the core technology of its era with a victorian spin yeah it it always has to have some sort of a weird victorian spin for whatever reason so if you play dishonored dishonored is basically they have slaughtered and murdered whales like whaling was the key to their technology technological advancement and 
everything is powered by whale oil and blood. No, that would ma- that would make Dune spice punk. Yeah. Well, that that's what Victorian? it would be. Yeah, spice uh, punk. It would be spice. I mean, punk. okay, I guess it's not Victorian. Uh, it, it doesn't have the Victorian era feel whatsoever. But their society Ooh. is powered by spice. Okay. How, how about how about this for a setting? And just just kind of shooting off the cuff, combining a couple of things together. We increase Dune to the Warhammer scale. Okay. Now That's follow me. What it is. Now follow, now follow me. Go ahead. All the ships, the spaceships that kind of float around the universe and doing do stuff, okay, are all ancient Victorian castles. Oh, there you the go. the Warhammer right. scale. Yeah. Because you know, that's kind of like what Warhammer ships look like. Mm-hmm. Um, so these giant floating like Victorian citadels just floating around space, farming spice off of worms, the power of their industry. Oh, that's creative. Setting confirmed. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. First. That you've heard of here first. That's the new D and D setting. <laughs> that's that's Vic- it. Victorian spice punk. <laughs> um, I know, I know, I know. D and D is involved with Hasbro. Um, I, I'm a Transformers. I want a Transformer setting. Uh, I want a weird. I want a weird system that like the Transformers can live in. You know, even if it's G.I. Joe and Transformers, you know, I'd, you could I'd be you, said you, you could just run it. You no, know, IV I mean, exists. Yeah. You wouldn't have to do that much work. Um, I'd love to see if I'd love to see a post apocalyptic setting like Fallout. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've talked about that one a few times and I, I I wouldn't be opposed to it. I probably wouldn't play it truthfully. But, you know, if somebody ran it, I'd jump in. I mean, you could definitely take. You can take, let's say, a post post destroyed America, mm-hmm. and you can have like the different like cardinal directions be different apocalyptic scenarios, and like in the middle of America is just like the Badlands, and nobody goes there. Yeah. So like you know. So like the, real. So like real life. This is like real life right now. Yeah. So like the Northwest was like natural disasters. You know, the Southwest was like. Um, I don't know, nuclear explosions and then Florida just became Florida more and then in the northeast they froze over. The, you know? far, the far northwest is where the vampires live in the trees. <laughs> um but the biggest announcement of the panel, and the one that we're excited for, drum roll please. Are we? <laughs> I, I'm terrible at drum rolls, by the way. But go ahead. Yeah, you're supposed to bang your hands on a on a table. Better. I didn't pick, Mike didn't pick it up. No, Mike, Mike didn't pick it up. Ah, oh, goddamn. Um, well, you you get the picture. They they announced a new, and the word they used was evolution of Dungeons and Dragons to be released in 2024. And the things they said about the system so far is that it's going to be compatible Fifth Edition. All right. That's uh, five point five. And that all the surveys that they're putting out previously from all the classes and the ones they have upcoming in the future are all going to help develop this new evolution. And we talked about it. We joked about it. I'm, a, I'm of the camp of the sixth edition. You're of the camp that is 5.5. And then I was thinking a little bit afterwards when we finished talking about it. The other thing that they announced with the, the gift set coming out, how they're retooling their monsters to be more, like instead of a list of spells and spell yeah. slots, they're moving their spells to like abilities <sighs> and kind of harking back to the fourth edition era on how monsters were built. Um, you mean the worst selling edition of all time? If that's how they're going to start putting out their monsters. All right. That's how they're making this new evolution and fifth edition be compatible. And I thought about that a little bit more. So what what that means is, is the current monster manual as it is, is not going to be compatible with this new evolution. It's going to be this new book that they're coming out with all the monsters. They're essentially giving us the monsters for this next evolution ahead of time. Yeah, I see that. Although the Morden Kanan's book that's coming out, the monsters of the multiverse, isn't going to have all the monsters from the you know, monster manual. It's picking no, and cho- it's picking and choosing. Like some of the ones they showed were not from the monster manual; they're from other books. 
they said it was going to be an account, um, an amalgamation of all the monster manuals. An, an amalgamation. That doesn't mean it's going to have every monster listed. Right, but it's going to have their new core set of monsters in it. Oh, okay. Well, I, I man, I do not see this playing out the way they expect it to. Uh, so, like, you know, me, and, me and Panda are of the mindset of do not dumb the game down more than it already is. And that, I don't, I don't think, I don't think the monsters and how they're changing them with moving spells, them out of spell slots into abilities, is dumbing the game down. They yeah, heavily do. Okay, I will. Oh, let me let me retract that. It's not that it's dumbing it down; it's making it flow easier for the DM. All right. IV flows incredibly easy already for the DM. Right. I mean, even, it's it's so stupidly easy by comparison to the previous editions, you know, that there's not much challenge in it. Right. I don't have a problem sitting here with my computer and D&D Beyond up when I have a spellcaster in the group that has seven levels of spell slots, okay? And I can easily see what their spell slots are. I can it, hover over the spell and have the spell pop up as a mouse over tooltip, and I know exactly what to do. If I'm sitting at a table with a book... I don't have that. You're right. I don't either because I sit at a table with a book. But that's you're the old guard of D&D that sat there with a book. Everyone nowadays sits there with a computer or a tablet. I did. I, that is not the case. It is definitely a lot higher than it used to be. But most, I, I can't say most. I don't have fucking hard numbers in front of me. But there are a lot of people that play at a table without a book, without D&D Beyond. There Having are a lot run. Of an extensive amount of Adventure League in the past couple of years. I would say, just thinking of the last table that I had, I had a computer, three other players had a computer, two didn't. I can say at my table, none of them have a computer. They all actually have... Old yard. No, most of my players are not Old Guard. Uh, I would consider two of us Old Guard... Uh, well, maybe three. Yeah, three of us I would consider the old guard of D&D. The others in our group have been playing for, I don't know, five years maybe? Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's not by any means that. Uh, and it is one of the old guards. That's the only one that uses a tablet for running stuff. Like, has his mm-hmm. character sheet on a tablet. So, I don't think I posted the, 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 what they said after watching it a second time. Um, they were, they're not moving to a digital only, digital only format. They That'd are going to be, be new. They did that, yeah. It'd be new versions of the core rule books. Um, Morning Canes presents the monsters of the multiverse is the direction that they're headed. Yeah, which I, 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 I mean, they're absolutely looking to push people out of the game is what's going to happen. They might what? not. They might not be thinking that's the case, but I I have zero problem going over to playing Hackmaster or playing, uh, you know, uh, the Paizo one. Yeah. That Bruce but runs. I definitely don't want to have more in adventure anthologies similar to Candlekeep. I like one a year. I don't want two a year. Yeah, you don't need those. Oh yeah, so that that's another thing that we wanted to talk about briefly was their changes on how they're talking about releasing campaigns. So and, they wanted to move from a book campaign setting release to a more of a um, smaller set adventures, which pretty much is how second edition ran, fourth edition ran. I'm not sure about third. Uh, third, third, first edition, second edition, third edition, at least I think from what Bruce mentioned. Uh, I know fourth edition did it this way. So I think all of the previous editions did it that way, where you they would release like a, I don't know, a 50 page module. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 50, 75 pages, something like that. Reasonably small modules. You know, it, ha- it would have maps attached to it and everything mm-hmm. you would need to run that module. And it usually would be from like levels one to five or one to four. And then they later on down the road, a few months later, they would release the next supplement for it. And then that would go three or four more levels. And then they'd release the next supplement for it. And they would release campaigns in pieces like that. And I I loved it that way. Uh, lots of other people like that's just sort of what people enjoyed, and you got a lot of just lore and I don't know more. It felt more creative. It felt like I don't know more like the the campaigns would grow that way. 
mm-hmm. as opposed to the we're just going to release a 200 250 page book here's everything uh you know run it up to level 12 and then that's the end of it yeah uh doing it the the way they're talking about doing it if they really decide to do this and knowing the way they've learned things they probably won't but you could easily extend those campaigns on up to 20 release five books over the course of a year of these modules each one do four levels or something like that and you know we we talked about earlier sure the higher you get in there maybe the less of them you sell but just you know produce mass produce less of them so i mean that's that's exactly how fourth edition ran with their cord and interior veil Mm -hmm. set there was one two three four five six products that were released it was just a small folder. You opened it up. There were two. There's a DMs version and like another version of the. Like there's one that was a lore pack and I think one that was just the actual adventure. And then you had all had like two sets of battle maps that came with it. Yep. And that was that was the the best part about it. But the battle maps came with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know. Uh, and here's then, like here. you Go run ahead. the well, you run the adventure and you know blah 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 happens. Use the maps and. Well, the keep on the shadow fell is the first one, and you kind of stop this Orcus cult from taking over Falkrest. Yep. And then the next couple don't really have much to do with the Orcus and and showing up in the cult either, but they're still there. Okay, they come back near the end where you have to stop them again from summoning Orcus, and that leads into the final thing, which is literally fighting Orcus. And then into your veil campaign ends with you fighting Orcus. Right. At what, just, le- at what level? 20. Yeah, perfect. He, uh, and the way 4th edition was made, you lost to him unless you min-maxed <laughs> along sure. the way. I mean, but that's how campaigns are meant to be. I think I would like that a lot better. Uh, um, here's here's another thing that you can throw on top of that, since we already know that WotC and Hasbro, they're, they're just money-grubbing like crazy right now. So you you take these supplements that we're talking about, release the modules, do four or five of them for the campaign, and you do them at twenty five bucks piece. That way, mm-hmm. they're still cheap enough; people will buy them. You know, I, I got no problem throwing twenty five bucks at something. And then after the whole thing has been released, all five modules, you know, it's three months later or whatever, six months later down the road, you release the book that's all of them together. Mm-hmm. That way, the people who didn't want to go back and buy the individual ones, bam, there's your whole thing. And, you know, it also gives you six months to do updates to it and make, you know, tweaks and changes along the way. So you get the new updated version of the campaign. So there's a big problem that's been existing with Hasbro as a company. Uh, There are a lot of problems. (laughs) Well, and the word that is thrown around and used a lot is wallet fatigue. (laughs) Yep. Um, yeah, and the issue it just hits Magic the Gathering more, but it does hit D and D, where Magic the Gathering is coming out with like a new set every month. Technically, yeah, it's it's ridiculous at the moment. It's it's insane, especially when these sets are like two hundred and fifty dollars for twelve boosters. Like that's, I mean that's, that's not brutal. that's not the norm, but yes, they have done that, and that's just no, stupid. Well, that, that's the thing, Jason. It is the norm now. No, it, because, well, no, it isn't. Because, the forgot, you can buy a box of Forgotten Realms for you know a hundred dollars. No, and no, that's, what I'm, that's thirty-two boosters. They they are putting out a set every month. Okay. Yes. A new standard set comes out every three months, right? Yep. Yep. So the other two sets that get released are the two hundred and fifty dollar box. So the norm is they're putting out the two hundred fifty dollar boxes more than they're putting out the hundred. Yes, but those are not. Sets. Those two hundred and fifty dollar boxes are not twelve boosters. Right, that's the sorry, that's collector boosters then. Right, those. that's what I'm. And there's that's and there's I'm always those at. that come out for those. But they've been talking about getting rid of the draft booster box because it's not making them enough money. And moving I, to set boosters, a hundred percent. I mean, if they want to kill their product, go for it. But the so when it comes to these individual monsters or modules, if if Frostman was divided up into two chapters, like here's here's ten towns. Here's Sunblight, and here's here's Grim Skull and um, the caves. Right. And here's a final one for the last area. And you charge me twenty five dollars a piece for those four, and I'm spending a hundred dollars now when I could have spent fifty dollars on a book. People will do it. 
it you're you're breaking it up into chunks that are are palatable uh yeah that i mean it is uh so, now mind you icewind dale would not have worked in, in that fashion they could have done an icewind dale campaign that would have worked in that fashion but you'd have to expand it if you broke it up in the manner that you just suggested sunblight is not that long of a chapter it just isn't uh like they would have had to have added more into that same thing with the caves like they, they you know you don't have to do a hell of a lot more but you have to add a little bit more to those sections uh, but yeah, uh, that's, I mean, it is what people will do. That's how they used to release these campaigns. At any point, they could have taken, what was the one you were talking about earlier with Orcus? You know, the instead Fall of, campaign, yeah. yeah, Fall Crest, instead of doing it in those supplements, which you bought, which other people bought, they could have just released it as a $50 book. But instead, they did it that way, and everybody bought it. It's palatable right. chunks. If you throw something out for twenty or twenty-five bucks, people don't have much mu much issue throwing that kind of money out. Despite the fact that, yeah, you could have just done it as a fifty-dollar book one time. So it's it is going to make them more money that way. And that's what they're going to move to. They're going to move makes makes the money. You can't fault them for that, I guess. But nope. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't mind them doing that. I, I personally, I I just like it better that way. Yeah. I'm still probably not going to buy those, but I also I run homebrew stuff. You know this. Uh, it wouldn't be targeted at me. Yep. So is there anything else that happened this weekend that you want to talk about? Um, things we haven't covered would be the new Ranger class, the new Metallic Dragon lineage. Oh. Or uh, any of the cool dragons they talked about this weekend? Yeah, I, I know you did bring it up during our live stream. Uh, but maybe it was after the live stream. I don't even remember. We need to talk about it anyway. The what was it the Elder Brain Dragon? The Elder Brain Dragon, yes. Oh, do we have stats on this thing yet? No. Okay. I I know I had seen some information on what it does at least. Yeah, I can get it here. Uh they released it on comicbook.com. Uh, we'll we'll post a link to it so everyone can look at it. Um. The creature has a fly speed of 80 feet and can hover using its psychic levi levitation. What's more, the creature's breath weapon becomes decidedly more dangerous. The Elder Brain also takes over the dragon's breath weapon mechanism and spews a stream of brine filled, brine filled with tadpoles to begin performing ceramorphosis as it transforms the humanoids around it. Characters continue to take psychic damage even when, even when infested with the tadpoles, stabilizing if they're reduced to zero hit points but remaining unconscious until they transform into a mind flare. That's just horrifying. It it's horrifying. just horrifying. Uh, and I love it. I will probably not use it since I don't have mind flares in my homebrew, but if I ever run a campaign that has them, oh man, my players better hope they don't ever run across one of those things. I mean, that would have been a better opening to Baldur's Gate 3, in my opinion, too. Well, I well, they haven't finished Baldur's Gate 3. You know, they could still add that thing in there. They're never going to finish Baldur's Gate 3. The game is over. <laughs> uh, yeah, if I ever, if they ever manage to say, hey, we're finally done with Baldur's Gate 3, then I'll go back and play it. But I, I, I don't know if that's going to happen. I've watched to stream it, and it's still my biggest regret in streaming so far. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Well, hey, it wasn't you playing it. It was Thaladrid playing it. So that's not true. Your, yeah. Not your problem. But he drank all my monster. <laughs> yeah, I guess he did that. Um, did you look at the metallic dragon? I haven't seen it. Uh, send me a link real quick. Just go to facebook.com forward slash grumpy dungeon masters. Okay, so we we posted it. Hint, hint, we. Uh, the 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 ranger drake warden is pretty cool. It's just basically, hey, you get a dragon that teams up with you, grows with you, it gets bigger, you share resistance and with it and can breathe fire like it can. And then eventually you can ride it when you get turn 15. Um, well, technically you can ride it at like four or five. Um, no, I mean, medium dragon. Um, I, I see the moonstone dragon. Dra the okay. Moonstone yeah, dra the ranger. Drake dragon's another one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I hadn't seen these. I, I will check them out. Normally I'm pretty oh. good about reading oh. over this stuff. 
<laughs> Open up the Metallic Dragonborn. I guess I want to talk about that one. The Metallic Dragonborn? Mm-hmm. All right. You're humanoid. You're medium. Your walking so speed bad. is 30. You have Metallic Ancestry, uh, which means you choose one of the brass, bronze, copper, gold, silver. These already exist, by the way. Keep reading. Breath weapon, when you take the attack action on your turn, you can place one of your attacks with an exhalation of magical energy in a 15-foot cold. Each creature may, must make a dex save. On a failed save, the creature takes a d10 of the type associated with your ancestry. All right, and that goes up as you go up in levels. Yep. Uh, you can use your breath weapon a number of times equal to your prof bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Mm-hmm. Resistance. You have resistance to the damage type of your breath. Then there's the metallic breath weapon. Uh, third level, you gain a second breath weapon. When you take the attack action on your turn, you can replace one of your attacks with the exhalation of a 15-foot cone. Uh, it's a con save. Whenever you use this trait, choose one. Inner, innervating breath or repulsion breath. Innervating breath. Each creature in the cone must succeed on a con save or become incapacitated until the start of your next turn. Repulsion breath. Each creature in the cone must succeed on a strength save or be pushed 20 feet away from you and be knocked prone. Once you use your breath weapon, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Okay. That's not amazing to you? No. Oh. Because it's... when you take the attack action, okay? Yes. You can replace it with the breath weapon, okay? So your extra attacks, your extra attacks still go off. There are situations where that's going to be better than your normal attacks, certainly. There uh, are... And it's just, it's just a con save, okay, for a group incapacitation yep. or a group knockdown prone. Yeah, assume, and this is why I say there are situations where this would be good. If, if you're in melee with one guy, you're, the 15-foot cone is useless. If you're in melee with nine guys, you, you're going to get one of those dudes. May, may, maybe who? Well, it's your con, so your fighter, your con's going to be pretty high, so they're not going to be passing that all the time. I mean, your average save for that, at, at, if you're a fighter, the save DC is 8 plus your con modifier plus your proficiency bonus. What's your proficiency bonus at level uh, 3? Plus 3, I think? Yeah. And your con modifier, just assume you're going to have a 16 con. Yeah. So that's uh, 14? Yeah. That's not that high. That's not even hard. For level 3? Yeah. That's that's pretty decent for level 3. It's decent, but it's not that yeah. difficult. And your con's going to keep going up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, look, you, I, I, don't, I, don't, I definitely don't think it's terrible by any means. It's pretty good. I don't feel it's great by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I, I think do. I love it. I love the repulsion breath. You just sit there and go, me. Yeah, so and you can push. So you, throw then. Yeah, so you get to push one guy, you know, twenty feet away. Yeah. No, Which, well, the repulsion breath is a strength saving throw, not a con. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm aware. I mean, honestly, I'd just play a warlock who can auto push people ten feet. Yeah, but I like the fact that it made it so when you take the attack action, it subs in for that attack. Yeah. Which I don't think the Dragonborn reads that way. No, no. Uh, this is. Remember when they released the Dragonborn stuff on the Unearthed Arcana? This is the that's what this is. Yeah. Uh, which yeah, no, I I loved that aspect of it. The fact that you can supplement an attack for this as opposed to taking your whole damn turn to breathe. Right. Because nobody, um, I, I've I've played Dragonborns. I have other friends who played Dragonborns, and I nobody ever used their breath weapons because it took your whole turn. Yeah. I like this idea that this it's just part of your attack. Yeah. So you can just keep it going and still do your extra attack, use your bonus action to attack and stuff like that. Yep. Um, I, yeah, think, I think all the dragons should move to that. Oh, I know. Absolutely. 100% they should. No, that's a big, big upgrade that will make the... I mean, that was probably one of the feedbacks they got was nobody ever uses the breath weapon because it takes your whole turn. So being able yeah. to implement one of these, and in this case, you could, I, assuming I read everything correctly, I might have overlooked it, but you could breathe two of your breaths if you had two yeah. attacks. Yeah, uh, you, could, you can't do it once per turn. Yeah. yeah, you couldn't do the innervating breath plus repulsion breath, but you could do one of those plus the damaging breath. 
which is pretty cool. Yes. I mean, I like that. Yeah, you get everyone incapacitated, and then or it's a dexterity. Prone. It, what, what would be better? Let me think. Let me look it up here because I can't remember conditions for the life of me. Uh, there it, it wholly depends on situation. Incapacitated, if I recall right, you know, it does give advantage on the attacks against well, them. They're but making so, saves. Yeah. Uh, but so does being knocked prone. So I don't know that it really changes a whole lot, depending. It might just be a matter of, you know, what are you using it against? No bonuses either way. Yeah, so just it would just give you the uh, advantage on attacks. I want to bring this up that I keep that being incapacitated only means you just can't take actions or reactions. You can still move and do bonus action because I forget that. Every time. I just think that you're done. Yep. I always always envision like the rogue sapping you in like World of Warcraft. Little yeah, incapacitated. It's head. not as good as it sounds. Uh, that being said, it's still. I mean, that's still good breath weapon. It's just the things that you would really want to incapacitate. You want them to stop from doing things. So if you can close on a wizard and hit them with that breath. That's pretty good, because then they can't cast a spell if they fail that save. Yep. I want to breathe on you. Mmm, <sighs> <laughs> garlic. All right, well, that'll wrap up, us up for today. Uh, exciting new news in the D&D world. Um, it has a busy day on this stuff. I'm going to have to go back and actually read these other ones that I had not seen. And we can talk about them next week, the Drake Warden and the Moonstone Dragons. And a lot of these, I I think we covered the Moonstone Dragons previously, but that was Unearthed Arcana. So I think that's actually the actual dragon, too. Yeah. Uh, but, this all, this is, I know it says Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons, but this it's all these things that are just leading me to believe that Dragon Lance is next. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe. All right, Craig, take us out. Wait. Yeah, yeah. Who's, wait. Who's is it or, for us? Is it Bruce is it or is it Bruce or Panda? Roll a die. Find find um, out. Evens evens Bruce odds Panda. Odds Panda. All right, got it. Bruce is singing us out. See you guys. So long. The grumpiness has been your friend. Now go. And spread anger through D and D. No, don't do that. Be happy. Be friendly. Be awesome. Uh, but maintain the boiling hate that inside your heart. I don't know, buddy. I'm rambling at this point. Shut me up and end this podcast. <laughs>